I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Welcome to this podcast of The People's Pharmacy. You can find previous podcasts and more information on a range of health topics at peoplespharmacy.com. Scientists have found that we host a diverse microbiota in our bodies. What about our homes? What's in your basement? This is The People's Pharmacy with Terry and Joe Graydon. Every surface in our houses is covered with microbes. You can't see them, but they're there. On the counters, the floors, the walls, and in the water. How do your activities affect the ecology of your living space? How have homes changed over the last century? How has that changed their microbial ecology? What could be growing in your shower head or your hot water heater? Coming up on the People's Pharmacy, call us with your questions about the wilderness thriving in your living space. First, this news. In the People's Pharmacy Health Headlines, flu season should be winding down, but the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are warning about a second wave of influenza peaking in the southeastern U.S. Earlier this year, tests showed that the most common strain of flu virus was H1N1. Now, however, the H3N2 strain is becoming more common. That's the strain that caused such a terrible flu season last year. Both strains are covered in this year's flu vaccine, and experts report that the flu shot reduced the number of cases that needed medical attention by 47%. There is a new oral antiviral drug this year called Zofluza. One dose is all that's necessary to shorten the duration of influenza symptoms. The first really new antidepressant recently won FDA approval for treatment-resistant depression. S-ketamine nasal spray will be sold under the brand name Spravato. Physicians and patients have been eagerly awaiting the arrival of this new type of antidepressant. They may be shocked by the price. People starting on this medication will need twice-a-week dosing for the first month. The list price is roughly $600 to $900 per dose. That means the initial month could cost as much as $6,800. After that, People will require once weekly or twice monthly nasal spray administration. Those costs would range from $2,300 to $3,500. At the end of a year, Spravato could end up costing $45,000. Some insurance companies may balk at that expense. For years, health experts have been telling people that exercise is critical for good health and that walking is great exercise. Dog ownership can contribute. People who walk their dogs regularly get more exercise than people without pets. A study published in JAMA Surgery highlighted a downside of this otherwise pleasant activity, however. Dog ownership has increased in the U.S. over the last decade, but so have broken bones among older people out walking their dogs. Such fractures doubled between 2004 and 2017, with the majority of broken bones in women. About half of the breaks were in arms, wrists, or fingers. The other fractures, unfortunately, were more concerning. About 17% of the broken bones were hips, a situation that can have serious negative consequences for a person's mobility or even survival. The scientists recommend obedience training for pets so that they don't tug at the leash suddenly and tip a person over. In addition, it makes sense to match the dog and its temperament to the strength of the owner. Week after week, the FDA has announced recalls of contaminated blood pressure drugs called angiotensin receptor blockers or ARBs. So many lots of valsartan, herbisartan, and losartan have been removed from the market that there are serious shortages. To cope with this growing problem, the FDA has expedited the review of additional R products. This week, the agency announced that it had approved a new generic Valsartan from Alchem Laboratories in India. The FDA reports that its evaluation of Alchem's manufacturing process does not indicate a likelihood of contamination with nitrosamine carcinogens. 
New technology that allows for non-invasive imaging of the retina may allow eye doctors to diagnose Alzheimer's disease. The retina is richly supplied with blood through a dense network of fine blood vessels. In Alzheimer's disease, however, this network thins and becomes more sparse. Possibly, this reflects what's happening elsewhere in the brain as well. The imaging is optical coherence tomography and geography. Researchers at the Duke Eye Center compared the retinas of 39 people with Alzheimer's disease to the retinas of 37 people with mild cognitive impairment and 133 people with healthy cognitive function. In addition to the loss of tiny blood vessels in the retina, a specific layer of the retina was thinner in people with Alzheimer's disease. These changes did not show up in people with mild cognitive impairment. This is the second time within the past few months we've heard about the possibility that optical coherence tomography and geography may offer an early diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease. And that's the health news from the People's Pharmacy this week. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. I'm a pharmacologist. I'm Terry Graydon. I'm a medical anthropologist. Lately, we've been focused on microbiota. Last week, we talked with doctors Erica and Justin Sonnenberg about all the microscopic creatures that live on and in us. Today, we're going to explore the life that goes on around us in our home environment. If you have a question about the microbiota of your home, we welcome it. Our lines are open at 888-472-3366. You can send us an email, radio at peoplespharmacy.com. That number again, if you'd like to join the conversation, 888-472-3366. What's in your basement? Today, we are very pleased to have Dr. Rob Dunn with us in the studio to answer your questions. He's Professor of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University and author of several books, including Never Out of Season and The Wildlife of Our Bodies. His most recent book and the one most relevant for today's conversation is... Never Home Alone, From Microbes to Millipedes, Camel Crickets, and Honeybees, The Natural History of Where We Live. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy, Dr. Rob Dunn. Oh, it's great to be on the show. Thank you. Dr. Dunn, I grew up in Pennsylvania, initially on a dairy farm. Uh, So you would walk through cow pies periodically and drag that into the house. Uh, Later, uh, you know, spent most of my time as soon as I got home from school running around outside. You grew up in Michigan. Terry? Um, Well, mostly Pennsylvania, New Jersey, various other places, but everywhere. The, The thing is that we're of a generation older than you, older than a lot of our listeners, a generation that actually spent a lot of time outside playing when we were little. How have things changed? Uh, it, it's amazing. So if you, if you look at the, the most recent data for the U.S., which are similar to those for Europe, the average child born today will spend 23, 23 and a half hours out of the day in a building or in a car. Wow. And Which is to say, I mean, they almost don't go outdoors. Yeah. Not just that, I mean, in my childhood, like yours, I spent most of my waking hours outside in one way or another. And and a child born today is, is likely to spend hours, m- moments in transition outdoors. You you call them homo indoors. That's right. I mean, I think that's who we've become. And it's a, that's a little bit tongue in cheek, obviously. But, but something fundamental about how we live in the biological world has changed very recently. Well, what are the consequences? Well, I mean, the most obvious consequence is that the species we most directly interact with are now almost exclusively the species that live indoors. And so whatever effect those species have in our lives, they're having it all the time. So whereas before we'd be playing in the dirt, we'd be climbing trees, there was a big um, weeping willow in our front yard. I spent a lot of time up in that tree. And now it's mostly in front of the computer or the TV or, you know, playing games in the house. 
Yeah, and I mean, the, the weeping willow is a great example. So every moment that you're standing or sitting or acting in any way, you're in contact with other species. And so which species those are is, is totally a function of where you are. And so when you're on the weeping willow, you're exposed to the fungi on the branch of the weeping willow, the ba bacteria on the weeping willow, the insects in the weeping willow, the species that live inside the leaves of the weeping willow, the dust that's falling through the branches. And all of those species are very, very different from the species you'd be exposed to on a couch. Well, I can imagine some parents thinking, it's just as well my kid is inside. I don't want them exposed to all those things that are out there, and I don't know what they all are. But they're imagining that the kid's not being exposed to stuff inside. That's right. I mean, I think that we both, uh, we, we have very strong misconceptions about what's indoors with us and whether there's life indoors. And so the first thing we need to do to rid that misconception is to realize that we're never alone. And um, that's the title of the book, too. I didn't mean to parrot it. But that um, th that we've we've now sampled thousands of houses, and we've never encountered encountered a surface in a house that was devoid of life. Not a single surface. Not a single surface. <laughs> well, tell us, if the house is in Hawaii or in Kansas, how is it different from, how, how are those two different from each other? And then how are they different from houses in, uh, well, say, an apartment in New York or, or maybe a place in the Alps of Switzerland? Yeah, that's a great question, Terry. So the one element of that question has to do with how sealed up the house is. And so if the house is very sealed up, it won't be very different from place to place because it will be dominated by species that live on our bodies and that live on things that are in the house, that are components of the house as it was built. And so plastics and uh, dishwashers and hot water heaters. And so if, if, if you're in a sealed apartment, in some ways it doesn't matter very much if you're in that apartment in Manhattan or Ecuador or, or say, on the International Space Station, which is a kind of apartment and looks very much like one in, in New York. But if the windows are open, if, if there's a chance for life to come in and out of the house, then the house looks very different from place to place, and especially with regard to the fungi, with regard to the insects. Um, in that context, people are still very much connected to the ancient biogeographies, the ancient stories of the life around them. Well, I'm wondering about how homes have changed. I mean, I think back to that farmhouse that I grew up on, which was not a closed space. And I'm thinking about all of the modern homes that are sealed so tight. I mean, you, you can imagine a farmhouse from the 1820s, maybe a log cabin, for example, and now, if you live on the 60th floor of an apartment building in New York City, it's a completely different environment. It, it, it is, and even the apartment is different from what the, the same apartment would have been, you know, 50 years ago. And I, there's a Lysol commercial out right now that, that I think is uh, emblematic of that transition, that the, the, the ad shows germs of some vague kind, and there's the Lysol side and the no Lysol side. And the claim is something about, you know, 99% of germs are killed. And I think we, we've embraced this model. And, and what that model does is it favors 1%. And, and so in the last 50, 100 years, we've shifted to, toward favoring an unusual set of species alongside us. And it's either things that are able to get into our houses when we seal them off or things that are able to, to, to survive the assaults of all of these biocides. And so it's that 1%, um, it, but that 1% does very, very well. <laughs> yeah. Joe described to me a, a Lysol commercial he saw last night on the television. you want to tell us about well, uh, it? People were finding little, you know, dolls. They, they had, had managed stuffed to animals. find, you know, stuffed animals. And then, you know, they were finally, oh, thank goodness I found my child's stuffed animal. Oh, I need to wash it with Lysol to get rid of 99% of the germs, thinking that, okay, now it's going to be germ-free. And that's sort of an illusion. We've been using germicidal soaps, and we've been using all kinds of stuff, cleansers, and c cleaning our countertops like we're going to get rid of all the germs. A myth, right? It's a myth. I mean, we're – I mean, the – it's, it's a myth because we're so large in our actions relative to the scale at which the biology of these organisms takes place. 
And it's a myth because these organisms evolve very quickly and are extraordinarily diverse. And, and so whatever we imagine is killing the life around us is always only killing some of that life. And so there's a recent study showing that the antimicrobial dispensers that there's a pseudomonas species that's being favored on the dispenser <laughs> oh my. because they're because they're resistant to the the whatever is in the um, antibacterial. That, that's soap. right, and and they can then metabolize <laughs> a little bits of carbon that we're leaving there, and oh my they now have no competition. And so you dispense the soap under your skin. It kills a bunch of your good bacteria, and you inoculate the pseudomonas onto your skin. So we're shaping evolution. We're shaping evolution every day, every day. We invite you to join the conversation. Are there life forms you have noticed in your home that you'd like to know more about? What about those antibacterial soaps? Do you use them anymore? Our lines are open for your calls and questions. The number is 888-472-3366. Email us, radio at peoplespharmacy.com, or join the conversation. Again, that number, 888-472-3386. Dr. Dan, how are attics different from basements? You've, you've, you've done projects inventorying the um, microbiota of homes all over the country, right? We have. So we, we've sampled some, th- well, thousands of homes now, and we've done a couple of things. One of them is to sa- swab dust in those homes and then use DNA techniques to identify what's in the dust, um, sort of CSI bacteria and, and insects. And when we do that, we find that different places in the home have very different species. And so attics are different from basements. Basements are more like caves, and we see sort of cave makes associ- sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and attics sort of get more extreme conditions, but it's also true for for insects. We see different insects in attics and in basements. Right. I, I have seen a lot of camel crickets in the basement, and I've never seen them in the attic. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, they're, they're a great example. They're actually a cave. They're cave species that have moved into our houses with us, and they found the places in our house that are most like their ancestral habitats. What else do we have growing in our basements besides camel crickets? So one of my favorites is if you if you look if your if your hot water heater is in your basement or wherever it might be, there's actually a, a bacteria species that's found well b- before anyone looked in hot water heaters. The only place it was known was in hot springs in Yellowstone, and in Iceland, and it turns out that this species loves hot conditions near boiling temperatures, and so the hot water heater is perfect for it. <laughs> and so it sits in the hot water heater. It's totally harmless. It turns out to have enzymes that have been very, very useful to science. And, and it's just, it's living happily there. It's your reminder of So warmth. not harmful, but um, there, where we didn't expect it. That's, that's right. Yeah. You know, we, I think a lot of us think, oh, our hot water heater, it's so hot, it's sterile. Uh-uh. Yeah, very, very little is sterile. Well, we need to take a break. But when we come back, we're going to find out about the microbiota in your plumbing. How are we changing the ecology of our indoor cohabitants? Give us a call and share your thoughts and questions about microbes and fungi living with us and on us. Our number, 888-472-3366. Email us, radio at peoplespharmacy.com. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. This People's Pharmacy podcast is brought to you in part by Verizona.com. Verizona Lab offers home health tests that allow you to monitor your hormones and health conditions. You can take control of the quantitative assessment of your health and learn about male and female hormone balance, the stress hormone cortisol, leaky gut, gluten intolerance, or your gut microbiome. Take a more active role in tracking your health and take 20% off your first order of a mail-in testing opportunity with the discount code PEOPLE. That's P-E-O-P-L-E, all uppercase. To learn more, go to verizana.com. That's V-E-R-I-S-A-N-A.com. Thank you. 
Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. If you'd like to purchase a CD of this show, you can call 800-732-2334. It's show number 1157. Or you can find it online at peoplespharmacy.com. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Verizana, an analytical laboratory providing home health tests for hormones, gut health, and the microbiome. Online at V-E-R-I-S-A-N-A dot com. Today, we're talking about the thousands of species that share our homes. Our guest here in the studio is Dr. Rob Dunn. He's professor of applied ecology at North Carolina State University and in the Natural History Museum of the University of Copenhagen. He's author of Never Home Alone, From Microbes to Millipedes, Camel Crickets and Honeybees, The Natural History of Where We Live. Do you worry about the microbes in your kitchen sponge or on your cutting board? What about the bacteria in your bathroom? Oh, if you've got a question, our lines are open at 888-472-3366. If you can't get through because they're full, you can reach us by email, radio at peoplespharmacy.com. That number again, 888-472-3366. Dr. Dunn, you just told us about this fascinating species that... who. Its normal habitat, I guess we would say, would be geysers and hot springs. And now we find it living in our hot water heaters. What other types of species would we find in our plumbing? And in our shower heads. So, so we, we find thousands. So all, all the water that comes into your home is full of life. And there are thousands of species uh, in your tap water, just as in bottled water. Should be very clear. And we've, we've whoa, studied... Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what did you just so say? So there is, there are living species living in those bottles of water. Those bottles of water are full of interesting species. Some of them very unusual. There, there's a species in, that's common in bottled water of, of Delftia, which is a bacteria that actually precipitates gold. And, Whoa! And so it's an alchemist bacteria. And wow! So it, it's sometimes in there. It's also in tap water. But but that water is alive, so you you can't get away from it. It's always I been alive. I think people imagine you know when they buy a bottle of water, it's sterile. I, it, not I, not true. It's interesting because all of this life is invisible to us. We're we're very capable of imagining things that are that are very far from reality, and it's easy. And but to, to imagine that we're surrounded by life is a very difficult thing for us for some reason. Right, can't see it. Uh, tell us about those shower heads. So in shower heads, you get this very unusual habitat right at the shower head that's wet, then dry, then hot, and then cold. And so it favors bacteria that can build a little apartment for themselves called a biofilm. They kind of excrete this apartment working together. And so we've been studying what lives in those little apartments of microbes. And it turns out to vary a great deal from shower head to shower head. And one of the key factors is whether or not your water is chlorinated and how much residual chlorine is in the water. Regardless of chlorination, there are bacteria, but if, you get, if there's chlorination, you get different bacteria. You get species that are a little more tolerant of the chlorine. And those can include non-tuberculous mycobacteria that if you're immunocompromised or if you have an unusual lung architecture, it can be problematic. But at the same time, some of those species we now know actually produce serotonin and so it can be beneficial. And so a lot depends on which species. And so this is one of these classic cases where we don't know quite enough to tell you which is bad and which is not. You know, what What astonishes me about what you just said is, you know, chlorine. And everybody assumes, well, let's say I'm drinking water from the city. It's chlorinated. It kills everything. And what you're saying is not so fast. That's right. I mean, almost nothing we do kills everything, to, to, re, to re, return to that refrain. But one, one of the important things in the context of chlorination is, is that if we don't mess up our aquifers, in many cases, we can rely on water that comes right up out of the ground and drink that water and use that water. Uh, but it's rare that we haven't screwed up our aquifers. Uh-huh. That's Yeah, that and, was a big if. Yeah, and, and so as a result, that water, if it's polluted, especially with fecal oral pathogens, we need to treat it. And so the chlorination becomes very important, but at the same time, it changes what's there. Let's go to the phones. Rick in Tampa, welcome to the People's Pharmacy. Your question or comment. 
Thank you for taking my call. My question is for Dr. Dunn, is how do these organisms in our microenvironments affect the things like the development of our immune system and say, for example, things like the development of allergies? Great question, Rick. Thank you so much for the call. Dr. Dunn, uh, the idea that our environment and our microenvironment and all those bacteria and fungi and other stuff might impact our immune system is probably a strange idea for a lot of people. It, it is, and it, it's, a, it's hard to imagine. It. Our immune systems are as complex as our brains, and so we still don't fully understand them. But one of the things we're beginning to see is that our immune systems see, seem to need to be exposed to a certain diversity of bacteria and other organisms in order to figure out the world and to work properly. And we're now seeing a series of of useful natural experiments that, that show us what happens when they're not. And so, for example, in Finland, in the region called Karelia, that region was split in half at the end of World War II. And the same people ended up on both sides of the border, the Russian side, the Finnish side. They then faced very different ecological conditions over the next years. And on the Finnish side, a sort of Western European future unfolded. Um, more cement, less biodiversity, more sealed up houses. And, and as that unfolded, people saw a rise in allergies and asthma and MS and many, many of these inflammatory disorders that Rick is asking about. At the same time, on the Russian side, over the same years, more or less the same people, allergies and asthma never rose. Because? It looks as though it's because the exposures to bacteria on the two sides of the border are very different. And on the Russian side, people are still getting outside they're still connected to the biodiversity around them. And so their, their immune systems are still developing in the way they might have over the last hundred million years. This sounds a little like the so-called hygiene hypothesis. It, it is. It's, it's very related. And I think there's, there's now a, a, a grab bag of related hypotheses, um, which differ in their details, but all come to the conclusion that we need to still be exposed to a diversity of kinds of microbes in order for our immune systems to work normally. 888-472-3366 is the number. We go to Hope, Arkansas. Mike, welcome to the People's Pharmacy. Hi, Phil and Terry. How are you today? Doing well, Mike. What's your question for Dr. Dunn? Well, as we look at the flu outbreaks uh, throughout this uh, this season, uh, we're seeing that the uh, the all the antibiotics that are the antibiotics and the uh, hand sanitizers that we use. Uh, we're going to develop an immunity at some point. So are we, in, in essence, uh, giving the building blocks for a superbug down the road? Good question. Dr. Yeah, that, Dunn. That's a great question, Mike. Uh, so, so it turns out that the antibiotics that we use and, and most of the antimicrobials uh, deal with, they, they treat bacterial infections and not viral infections. And so the flu is, is viral. And yet we get prescribed antibiotics very, very often when, when we have the flu. In fact, if you look at the, the rate of prescription of antibiotics, the best predictor of when doctors prescribe antibiotics is the flu season. Even though, of course, antibiotics do nothing for viruses. That, that's right. And, I, and that's, I mean, that, that there are these different groups of organisms and different things treat them. It it's, it's, can be very complex, but, but antibiotics don't help with the flu. And yet we prescribe them all the time. And it, exactly as Mike points out, what that's doing is it's favoring a suite of microbes that are resistant to those antibiotics so that when we do have an infection that requires an important antibiotic, the infection is no longer treatable with that antibiotic. And, and that is increasing. And the other piece of this problem is that our rate of discovery of new antibiotics has slowed dramatically. And so we're in a moment when we need to use antibiotics very, very, very carefully uh, in those cases when we most need them. We yeah. need to really be stingy with them the rest yeah. of the time. Yeah. Now, I've heard that we have a cloud around us. It's hard for us to even imagine, that, but this sense that we drag with us a kind of microbiota, and every place we go, we leave behind our detritus. Is, is that really Yeah, true? I noticed it around you, Joe. I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> but the, you can see the cloud. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> That, that's right. I mean, we're, we're falling apart all the time. It's a, it's a feature of being a, a live vertebrate. Um, 
And as we fall apart, the microbes on our skin from different parts of our body. <coughs> Whenever we cough. They, right, they, they ride those bits and pieces. And so this cloud follows us. Um, and historically, uh, we've, even as recently as 100 years ago, th- that cloud wasn't with us all the time. But as we've sealed ourselves in more and more, we're, we spend more and more time with our cloud. Well, we've actually got an email question about the cloud. Joseph wants to know, how about a bacteria that can live in our armpits that doesn't smell and that outcompetes the smelly ones? Is there such a thing? And what is the impact of antiperspirant on our microbiome of our armpit? Oh, th- these are such great questions. Um, so so uh, very quickly, the, so the armpit has apocrine glands. Those glands appear to serve, serve no function other than to feed bacteria, as Joseph points out. And historically, they've tended to favor a kind of slow-growing, old-growth forest bacteria called uh, Corinobacterium. And so that's what produces that odor. Um, right now, uh, I don't know of anybody that's trying to, to sell or offer um, bacteria that would replace those. In, in some ways, though, what we do with antiperspirant is something very similar to that. What antiperspirant does is it closes up those apocrine glands. And in doing so, it stops the food that's going to those stinky bacteria. And so what happens is that instead, other bacteria move in. And so that we've shown um, in experiments uh, working with the public that people who use antiperspirant uh, have more staphylococcus bacteria in their armpits and over their body. And so in a way, we've done that experiment with antiperspirant. I think what we would hope for is a, is a good enough understanding of these different microbes to know which ones do we most need and how do we favor those, and we're not there yet. I was going to say, at this point, that's still questionable, right? Yeah, I mean, I, if I had to guess, and I'm speculating, that I think that the, the bacteria our body um, is favoring naturally, that they probably had some benefit at some point in the past, whether or not they do today. And I think we, we need to understand that benefit in as much as we're changing the, the abundance of those bacteria dramatically, uh, and we don't really yet. We've got a fascinating question from Beaufort, South Carolina. Glenn, welcome to the People's Pharmacy. Your question, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, concerning pets in the house, not just dogs and cats, but aquariums and birds, things like that, any information about the, the long-term health impact to, for humans living in houses with pets or, or without pets? And has the pet's biome evolved over the uh, recent past. Uh, do we even know whether pet biomes have evolved? Ah, that's a great, great question, Glenn. Um, these are wonderful. Uh, so so we, we know from our studies that we can tell which pets are in your house as a function of which microbes are in your house. And so if we swab your house, we can tell you if you have a dog. That's a really expensive party trick, but we can do it. And, and you already know, right? So, but <laughs> I was not a good say trick. most um, people do um, <laughs> But, but which is to say that bringing a pet in has a very big effect on the microbes in the house. It's the biggest effect of any we've studied. Um, and especially dogs, and maybe that mostly has to do with the size of the dog relative to the size of the house. And so maybe 10 cats and a, or four cats and a dog balance out in terms of how much of an effect. So far, it looks as though that that effect is very species specific. And so dogs favor a set of fur associated microbes, drool microbes. And also bring in many, many... Well, s- fur, fur, drool, and drool. let's not forget all the uh, stuff that they're bringing in on their feet. Dogs have muddy feet. That's, that's right. And so the biggest effect we see with dogs from a health perspective is that especially in cities and not so much in rural environments, it looks as though houses that have dogs in them, when, when, uh, when babies are in utero, those children are less likely to suffer from allergy, allergy and asthma. And we don't totally know what's going on there, but, but my, my thinking and, and that of others it's, is that uh, when you have a dog in the house and you're living in the city and you have very few microbial exposures, that that dog and what come in, comes in on the dog's feet is your last sort of connection to nature. And that in some prob- probabilistic way, it may sometimes be enough uh, to make your immune system function normally. What about people who let their pets in bed with them. I mean, you know, there's a very interesting group of bacteria that may come along with the pet. And, you know, are we making a mistake there or is that a good idea? Uh, it, yeah, it, it's it's tricky and there won't be a single answer. 
um, which is always dissatisfying, but it's nonetheless often true, that some of the microbes that you're sharing with your dog can be beneficial. And so the, we actually see some dog fecal microbes in uh, the guts of children who have dogs, um, which means those are being transferred and they're surviving. In the cases I'm aware of, that's either been documented as having no negative effect or even having some so positive effect. So it's sort effect. of like a fecal transplant, but done sort of accidentally. Yeah, and, and, and in this, that's a good reference point in the sense that if, if it's too much of a transplant, all those fecal oral pathogens we worry about, worry about with humans have the potential to, to be transferred. And at the same time, we need some microbes to colonize our gut. And so... Moderation uh, is probably a reasonable sentiment here. Well, along the same lines, we have an email from Rose. She says, here's something I've wondered about. How is it that parents of newborns don't always have food poisoning? They're being exposed to poopy diapers, and I'm sure they wash their hands, but probably imperfect. So do they become inoculated to the bacteria in their kids' diapers? That's, uh, these are my favorite questions. So, so uh so a breastfed baby is um, primarily has a gut filled with bacteria able to digest the breast milk. Right. Breast milk does not have iron. As a result, the bacteria that survive in the gut of a newborn breastfeeding baby are a set of bacteria that are very unusual and largely contain no pathogens. Okay. And in fact, those diapers look and smell different from those uh, from a, di- uh, a baby that's not breastfed. That's, that's right. They're very, very different and, and dominated by the same bacteria we find in yogurts and other fermented foods that, that are living off that milk. With Fascinating. That yeah. You know, this is all incredible because when you think about how we've changed – Uh, From diapers, you know, now to disposable diapers, as a for example, I mean, that probably has had an impact on the microbiota in the house. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and I don't know. I'd have to think about what effect that would be. But I guess the broader statement is we make many, many changes to our daily ecology without thinking about how they're affecting all the species around us. We we use dishwashers. We wash our clothes in, in washing machines. And each of these somehow or another affects what we live with. And we're going to come right up on a break, so we don't have time to take another call. But I I keep wondering, when we see those commercials, like you mentioned, for Lysol, are they doing us any good? That is to say, are these antibacterial products really helpful? Because we can never really get rid of all the bacteria, and maybe we don't even want to. So, so what we know is helpful are the traditional public health measures. So washing your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds after you go to the bathroom, it saves millions of lives every year. Keep doing it. Old-fashioned soap, it works. Getting vaccinated, it works. Making sure that the food in your, in your, in your refrigerator doesn't stay too long. Those things all work. So keep we, should keep, we should keep following our mother's advice. Depends on your mother. (laughs) (laughs) We need to take a short break, but when we come back, we'll take more of your calls about the microbiological ecology in your office, your car, or your home. If you'd like to join the conversation, our number, 888-472-3366. If our lines are full, you can email us, radio, at peoplespharmacy.com. We're also on Twitter, at People's Pharmacy. You're listening to The People's Pharmacy with Joe and Terry Graydon. If you like the information you hear when you listen to The People's Pharmacy, you may also enjoy our book published by National Geographic. It's The People's Pharmacy Quick and Handy Home Remedies, available online at peoplespharmacy.com or at your favorite bookstore. Welcome back to The People's Pharmacy. I'm Joe Graydon. And I am Terry Graydon. If you would like to purchase a CD of this show, you can call 800-732-2334. It's show number 1,157. That number again, 800-732-2334. You can also place your order online at peoplespharmacy.com. The People's Pharmacy is brought to you in part by Verizona. 
an analytical laboratory providing home health tests for hormones, gut health, and the microbiome. Online at V-E-R-I-S-A-N-A dot com. Today we're talking about the microbes, millipedes, camel crickets, and other critters that share our living space. Dr. Rob Dunn, professor of applied ecology at North Carolina State University, is here in the studio with us. His book is Never Home Alone, From Microbes to Millipedes, Camel Crickets and Honeybees, The Natural History of Where We Live. And I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to say it is fascinating. Oh, it's a great book. Why shouldn't you say that? We love your book. I, 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 loved, I loved your <laughs> discussion you. of going through the rainforest and uh, with your machete. And I mean, it, it's just a fa- and And Von Lee, pronounce his name, Von oh, Lee I don't do a great job either, but Le- Leeuwenhoek, yeah. Yeah. Uh... I mean, I remember reading about him in probably in high school, and uh, I mean, he was he was a genius. He really was. He's one he's one of those characters too. Where in, in a book, you always delete more than you write, right? And I, I could have written fifteen chapters about him; it wouldn't have made sense in the book. But he, he, so he was an amateur scientist. He became fascinated with with single lenses through which he could see small things, and he started to look around his house and around um, his town of Delft in the Netherlands. And in doing so, he, st- he began to see things no one had seen before. Did and, they think he was crazy? Um, so the, so when he, what he, he didn't have scientific peers. He mostly had artist peers. And so it was a town in which Vermeer lived and many other sure. artists. And so Delft, he, he, was, yeah. he was like them. Um, but when he started to r- write letters to scientists sharing his observations, they were very skeptical of him. I, cr- crazy may be strong, but... They weren't sure whether they should believe all his observations uh-huh. is probably the way to put it. Because <laughs> okay. he, he saw protists for the first time, single-celled life forms. He saw bacteria for the first time. And suddenly this entire world that was everywhere around him opened up. And he just ran into it with wonder for 50 years. <laughs> and it took us a long time to catch up with him again. And you, and you are sort of the modern-day version of him. You've been looking everywhere. Well, our listeners need to join the conversation. If you've got a question or a comment for Dr. Dunn, the number is 888-472-3366. You can email us, radio at peoplespharmacy.com. And we go to a husky, North Carolina Charles, welcome to the People's Pharmacy. Hi, Terry. Hi, Joe. Hi, Hi Doctor from North Carolina State. Um, I'd like to ask a question and I'd like to give a somewhat brief answer and then ask your thoughts. The question is, how do we encourage youth to get outside? And my answer is a combination of encouraging uh, STEM education of organic gardening health promotion using plants uh, like the purple sweet potato, production of biofuels such as levulinic acid from high cellulose plants, pyrolysis of biomass to create biochar as a soil amendment that has a lot of fixed CO2 in it, electro bio commodity production, and internal combustion of biofuels to drive flywheel direct electricity production of very low emission uh, electricity um, generation. So what about the idea of getting kids outdoors? What are the benefits or risks? So, so there are huge benefits of getting kids outdoors. And and some of the benefits relate to the book and, and, and have to do with being exposed to the kinds of microbes we need to stay healthy. And what Charles... Charles's idea of getting kids out gardening at schools is hugely beneficial. Some of them relate to mental health. There are lots of good data now suggesting being outdoors promotes mental health. And, and there are risks outdoors. There are risks everywhere. And the, the risks are far outweighed by the many, many benefits. Um, so go out with your kids and everybody benefits. Yeah, go out with your kids. Make it part of your daily life. We, had, we did an experiment on bread at, at one point, and... It doesn't seem like it, it will relate, but it does. When we studied the hands of bakers, we found that, that first of all, the, the bakers were actually contributing their microbes to the flavor of the bread that they were making, which is interesting. In <laughs> so, 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 so actually, there are distinct flavors, <laughs> the, the, depending on who made the bread. That's right. And, and they actually come from the body of who made. 
But the other thing we accidentally found out was that when we, when we looked at the baker's hands, 70% of their microbes were bread-associated microbes that are very rare on most people, which is to say that the way in which they lived their life was recorded in the microbes that lived on them. And so I think for children and going outdoors, what do we want our, the bodies of our kids to, to say about them? I think we want, to say, want them to say that they spend time outdoors, that they're in the soil, that they're on the willow branch. And, and that trains their immune systems, presumably, as well. Yeah, it, it, it changes who they are biologically as, as humans. Okay. Back to the phone. Steve in Radford, Virginia. Welcome to the People's Pharmacy. Your question. Hi. I'd like to know about house centipedes, or some people call them millipedes. I used to kill them, but they'd be back in three or four days, so now I just leave them. Are there any benefits to having them run around your basement? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, so house centipedes, you, many people have seen them. There's really leg, leggy um, uh, arthropods that run around homes. They, they like cockroaches very much, and they're actually quite specialized in being able to kill and eat cockroaches. Ah, so you might not want to kill your centipedes. Yeah, so if you, if you don't like cockroaches, uh, you should like house centipedes. <laughs> okay. We have, a, we have an email from Mike who says, I live in a 100-year-old farmhouse in central North Carolina. What kind of historic microbes and bacteria could be hanging out in the house that are not found in newer houses based on differences in building materials and the fact that the house is not even close to being sealed? Yeah, that's that's a good question, Mike. Um, so so uh, we know that the legacy of a house and what it's built out of influences which microbes it has. And so different microbes live on and break down different materials. And so it depends on which what species of wood is used, for example, what kinds of pipes one has, all of those things. At the same time, any pieces of the house that are old that can still be eaten by a species are, are feed, may, could be feeding species that have been there a long, long time. Okay, so what are species eating in our homes? Everything. Um, and, and so this, in this context, the space station is an inter, interesting example that the International Space Station is, is, has two kinds of species, species that eat people and, or live on people and species that are living on the station itself. And that includes degrading metal. It includes degrading the plastics. For a while, the mirror, the Russian space station, the windows fogged over with a fungus. Uh, and so everything at, over, at some time interval can be eaten. So have you actually analyzed uh, the mic? Probiota of the space station, or, or did you have to rely on somebody else who did that? So, so, so uh, one of our my colleagues did um, uh, a student who was at the University of California Davis, and she used the same approach that we use to study houses, and sent the same swabs to the space station, and the astronauts swabbed the space station, and so we were able to compare then the cool. space station to houses in Raleigh and around the U.S. using exactly the same approach. That that is great. Now, we have a question from Charlotte, North Carolina. David, welcome to the People's Pharmacy. Your question, please. Thank you, and hello. Well, I can't go so far as the space station. This is my own bedroom. Okay. Um, and I lived in West Central France for a while. This happened two times, and uh, there was a black mold that developed on one of the walls in my bedroom, which after, I'd say, a couple months was finally done away with because the landlord had installed new uh, insulated windows, and then... Uh, he just increased the airflow uh, by uh, from and, and and it got rid of it. But it had been for a couple months, and then here more recently, a few years ago in Charlotte, uh, we were also in a bedroom where there had been some sort of leaking from the from the uh, uh, climate system, and and the wall developed a black mold there too. And I tried getting rid of it with bleach, and uh, it seemed like it would come back even worse. And uh, So my question is, you know, what is it? I just called it black mold, but, you know, do you know what it might be and if there are any short or long-term effects uh, from it? Yeah, that's a great question. Black mold doesn't sound good, but without knowing exactly what it is? Yeah, yeah, so it's it's interesting. So the... What's often referred to as black mold is is fungus called Stachybotrys Stachybotrys chartarum. But um, there are many black fungus species. And in houses, we've found more than 40,000 species of fungi. And so knowing exactly which black mold somebody has is very difficult without um, identifying it. Uh, that's, that said, the most common black mold, that one I just mentioned, 
what we now know happens with it is when new houses are built, it actually comes in with the drywall. Mm. The inside the drywall, the, the fungus is already there. It's totally harmless um, in the wall unless the wall gets wet. And then suddenly that, that drywall becomes edible to the fungus. And so maintaining the dry conditions and walls is really key to controlling fungi. Um, and, but when the house gets wet, suddenly much of it is edible for fungi. Well, we started developing black mold in our bedroom or, or black something. And it was growing and it was kind of scary. And we got rid of it and then it came back again, just like David's situation. And eventually we found out that the humidity, especially in the summer, you know, it's been raining in the southeast so much and it's been hot and humid in the summer. Somebody came in and looked in our crawl space and they said, oh, my goodness. I mean, your your joists are dripping water because you've got all this air conditioning duct work down here. The hot air, the hot, humid air comes in through the vents, hits that air conditioning, turns into water, and it's a marvelous environment a playground for mold. Yeah. for mold so we had a group of people come in in like space suits i mean they they literally were covered head to toe they removed all of the insulation that was just completely moldy they had like they they had an amazing air system i mean it looked like you know something from outer space and they removed all of this stuff and then they sealed up the basement and it's now much drier because there's no longer that humidity po- problem. Tell us a little bit about crawl spaces in the southeast and humidity. Yeah, so so fungi in general require moisture, um, but once they have moisture, th- they can start to break down almost anything we use as a building material, even stone. Uh, and they do it by releasing compounds that, that break down the material, and then they, they eat what, what's been broken down. And so controlling moisture is really, really important to, in terms of controlling the fungi that are in your house. Most fungi in your house, even if they're abundant, are not super problematic. But, but a, a few are more problematic, especially in the context of allergy and asthma. And, and in those cases, if you can remove the material that's actually been, has a lot of fungal growth on it, and get things to be dry, um, in most cases, it looks like that that controls the problem, but often you do have to remove it. But what, what about shower curtains? They seem like a really nasty thing. So, so all of these new habitats that are wet, then dry, hot, then cold, they favor very unusual fungi and bacteria that we don't see many other places. And so shower curtains are one of those. And so like that pink fungus that you see. Well, as a matter of fact, we have an email from Bill who says, I have a red growth in various areas in my bathroom. It keeps returning no matter how often I clean it up. What is it? And is it a health risk? Oh, and if it is, how do I get rid of it? So, so there, there, are, uh, there are a number of red things that like bathrooms. The red is actually their protection from UV and other sort of ordinary natural assaults, which also seems to, to be useful to them in protecting them from us. And so that's why we see a lot of pink and red things in the bathroom it relates in part to how frequently we're cleaning and sort of trying to get rid of them. Um, and, and so several of those red, red, pinkish species in the bathroom are chlorine tolerant. They don't mind it so much. You knock them back and then they slowly grow. And, and most of them are totally harmless. Um, and so aesthetically, you don't particularly like them, but they're probably okay. But and, not to worry too and much. And the dishwasher? Um, dishwasher, same, very similar conditions. Hot, uh, dr- cold, dry, wet, soapy, not soapy. And in dishwasher, the soap dis, uh, container, whatever you want to call that. Yeah, it is a soap dispenser. Dispenser. The, um, in, in those soap dispenser containers, uh, there's a fungus that's very common. And emblematic of what we know about houses in general, the only thing we really know about it is it's found in that, those soap containers and in the feces of some tropical bats. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, oh, and, fascinating. And surely that's not the whole story of the fungus. There's I would much think more not. to it. But that's, we <laughs> How often, we're often presented with these anecdotes. And what do we do about that? I think we have time for one last call. Saratoga Springs. Kathy, welcome to the People's Pharmacy. What is your question? Thank you. I have a question about mites. Uh, a friend of mine recently got a Shalazian, uh that's a sty in his eye, and the doctor said it was a mite. What can we do to prevent that? Oh, okay. So that's actually probably a different kind of mite than, in fact, 
it is certainly a different kind of mite than the mites I thought you were going to ask about, which are the dust mites. That live in our mattresses. Yeah, so, so well, there are many mites in our daily life, and the average house has ten, tens of species of, of mites. I don't, know, I don't know enough about the, uh, this condition just to speak wisely about it, um, but, but we're surrounded by mites, and, and most of the time they're totally harmless. Um, all people have mites that live on them, and th- that species of mites, um, you know, is, is a friend. But we've been told a lot of people are allergic to dust mites, and they may need to keep the humidity down in order to reduce the likelihood that they will be in all of our mattresses, pillows, furniture, carpets, etc. That's right. Dust mites can become really abundant, and allergies to them are are common. Um, And In fact, those allergies tend to actually be to... uh, the, the human skin that, that the dust mites eat and then it's then sort of processed by their digestive system and then it becomes an allergen. Um, so it's quite complex as well. Um, but if you seal up your mattress, if you, you know, keep conditions uh, such that they're disfavored, you can control it to some extent. Well, that kind of leads us to our final question, which is, Dr. Dunn, how do we nurture a healthy microbial ecology in our living space? So I, I think a lot, a lot of what we can do is, is about moderation, um, not trying to kill everything, open the windows, let some life back in, go sleep on a willow branch, um, make fermented food that's alive and favoring species we know to be beneficial, um, get your kids outside as often as you can, have a dog if you like having a dog because they can bring things in, but also be aware that the default lifestyle we've engineered for ourselves is one where we're no longer being exposed to the species that we need. And, and so we need to tend to that. So our old friends might be missing, and we need to make sure we have some contact with them. That's right. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for listening and calling in your questions. And thanks to our guest expert, Dr. Rob Dunn, professor of applied ecology at North Carolina State University. He's author of several books, including Never Out of Season, and The Wild Life of Our Bodies. His most recent and wonderful book is Never Home Alone. From microbes to millipedes, camel crickets, and honeybees, the natural history of where we live. Lynn Siegel produced today's show. Pamela Alberta provided technical assistance. Al Wadarski is our engineer. The People's Pharmacy is produced at the studios of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. The People's Pharmacy theme music is by B.J. Lederman. To order today's show or any People's Pharmacy broadcast, you can call 800-732-2334. Today's show is 1,157. That number again, 800 732 2334, or you can find it on the website, peoplespharmacy.com. At the site, you can tell us what you think about the show. If you still have questions about indoor microbiota, we recommend Dr. Dunn's book. You'll find a link to it on our website. And when you go to the website, you can also sign up for our free online newsletter or subscribe to the free podcast of the show. If you sign up for the newsletter, you'll get our free e-guide to Favorite Home Remedies. If you listen to the podcast, we'd be grateful for a review. In Durham, North Carolina, I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Thanks so much for listening. Please join us again next week. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If so, please consider taking a minute to write a review on iTunes. And thanks for listening to The People's Pharmacy.